Welcome to the Meaningful Work Matters podcast. I'm your host, Andrew Soren, founder of Eudaimonic by Design. On this podcast, we'll dive into the world of meaningful work, explore its complexities, and examine its impact on people and the organizations they're a part of. Each episode features insightful conversations with cutting-edge experts who are successfully navigating the challenges of meaningful work. We hope to offer you ideas, frameworks, and tools to unlock potential and design work that's fulfilling, impactful, and supports everyone's well-being. Subscribe or follow us now, and let's make meaningful work matter. Stephen Levithendahl, it is a wonderful thing to be able to have you on uh, as a guest on our podcast today. Um, thank you so much for choosing to uh, to share your wisdom with us uh, about uh, about meaningful work and and why it matters for you and the work that you do. Um, why don't we just start by by having you tell us a little bit about uh, about yourself and, and your relationship to the topic of meaningful work? Thank you, Andrew. It's a pleasure to be here and uh, spend time with you. I'm always a big fan of what you're doing in the world, and uh, I look forward to sharing this time together. I'm the CEO and the founder of World Being. We're a, a U.S.-based nonprofit organization that uh, works around the issues of or the challenges and intersection between uh, inner health and well-being and global well-being. I am um I've been a big fan I've been a big fan of your work for a long time. I think the the first time that I actually met you was um was was at an IPA World Congress many years ago um where uh where we've had a chance to um to exchange and I gotten to hear so much of the work that you've done at World Being formerly Corestone um in the space of well-being. Um can you just tell us a little bit about what World Being actually does? Sure. Our work focuses on vulnerable and marginalized adolescent youth and young women um, in low and middle income countries. Uh, we really focus on developing scales around, uh, excuse me, programs around well-being that can be scaled, you know, broadly and sustainably. To give a sense of the sort of scope of our work, I started this work in 2009 in a 800-year-old uh, Sufi enclave with just 100 girls in a small school called the Hope Project, a wonder, wonder, wonderful school. That was in 2009 with 100 girls. Uh, today, at where we are, have trained um, close to 500,000. I think the numbers are 470,000 youth and women and school teachers to date. Um, we work primarily in India, Kenya, and Rwanda, um, and we at this point, we're scaling up to what we expect to be about 5 million children per year um, across these three countries by 2026. And we've done that because out of a lot of program development and consistent research and evaluation and dissemination, uh, we've been able to enter into quite extensive uh, government relations with state and federal or nat nationwide ministries of education, for example. Um, and so that's really giving us now the opportunity to scale these programs uh, quite largely. The work that you do is incredibly inspiring, and it's one of the reasons why um, I'm I'm very excited to enter into this conversation about the role that meaning and meaningful work plays, um, especially in the context of of folks who are doing you know non-governmental work, nonprofit work, international development, or international aid work. There's um, there's been quite a bit of research that's been done over the years about the relationship between meaningful work and those spaces. And, um, and I think that we know, um, we know from that research that there's wonderful things about, um, about the ways in which meaning ultimately sparks, you know, motivation and commitment and, um, and, and ultimately impact in organizations. Um, but we also know that there's some potential downsides or dark sides of, of meaning in different kinds of ways. So I'm curious, um, let's just start with, I, I mean, I, I imagine that many people come to world being because they think that the work is deeply meaningful. Um, if that's a safe assumption, can you, can you tell us a little bit about what that looks like from your uh, perspective? Let me start by saying, when I say that we work at this nexus between inner well-being and global well-being, the concept is really around what we call working from the inside out with vulnerable and marginalized youth. And 
what do I mean by that? You know, from the, from the field of positive psychology, for example, we really work a lot initially around reimagining and exploring your self-identity and your self-concept. And this is very, very important when you're working with youth who come from, you know, just not one generation of poverty, but let's say in the caste system in India, for example, you know, thousands of years of discrimination, both by caste and by poverty and by gender and so on, right? So we start with that and then we move towards uh, emotional intelligence and emotional competence and then outwards towards assertive communication type skills, how to set goals, problem solving, conflict resolution, and so on and so forth. The reason I'm bringing this up is that a lot of this work is really internal. And mm, the international development sector in general is very good at working in the external. Like we're pretty good at building the hospital, building the clinic, building the school, building the roads, the infrastructure, and those kind of things. But traditionally, and this is changing now, but at least when I started 15, 16 years ago, there was this really big gap around mental health um, and well-being and how this influenced a person's or a child's sense of self-identity. So that's one, but also how this could potentially be a way for a child to be empowered to then change the system around them, pushing back against early marriage, pushing back against sexual harassment, um, gender inequities, staying in school longer, so on and so forth. So it has been really my contention, if you will, from the beginning, that if this is what we're going to teach, if these are the skills that we're helping to impart in others, then as an organization, we really have to model that model that ourselves. Hmm. So in answer to your question, why would people or why do people come to world being? We have, and I'm very, very happy to have seen this, uh, particularly in India, we've gained a reputation for being an organization that's different than all the others in where we work. Um, and that really comes down to the values of the organization, the culture, and of course, the work that we're doing externally, but very much about because of who we are internally, you know, within within our, our organization. It's really clearly articulated. And I think that we're going to dig deep into a whole bunch of those things that World Being is doing, uh, uh, probably as a bit of a of positive deviance within mm -hmm. the world in terms of how you are walking your own talk. Um, one of the things that I just hear quite clearly in the way that you articulate that is some of the ways in which meaningful work is conceptualized in in the literature. So, so I mean, often, often meaningful work is defined as work that is significant and worthwhile. Um, that was Michael Pratt and Ashforth's kind of seminal definition of what meaningful work was uh, back in the early 2000s. And since then, there's been a lot of research into how does that how does that meaningfulness show up? And um, and people say that it it shows up in the tasks that we do. So in I guess the work that you're describing, that's the actual kind of capacity building, skill building that you're doing in 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 the work, the, the actual development work, in the roles that you might have um, within the organization in the interactions um, between people, both kind of internally and externally within the organizations, and then the affiliation itself with the institution. So the organization's values, its purpose, its mission, et cetera. Um, does that sound about right to you? I mean, how, how do those things kind of show up in terms of oh, that world being? Yes, absolutely. And I think they're all very much interrelated with each other. There's no question people hopefully, hopefully there's no question that people come to work with us or for us, however you want to phrase that, because they're aligned with the mission. And one of the things that we say very early in all our trainings to staff is, you don't, for example, you don't work for me. You work for the mission. And the day that you don't feel that alignment or that passion, please self-select yourself out. Because there are countless challenges in the world and countless missions that you could align yourself with. So find your own passion. And if we are aligned with that, this is a great place for you to work. And if you're not, you know, you don't want to be here. Please don't waste your potential. And, and we don't want, <laughs> of course, we don't want to here because we want people who, who, who are aligned with that. So I think that sense of mission, uh, alignment with the mission, of course, is very important. Now, how do we support that? 
there's of course many aspects to that, but I think in terms of this conversation around meaning, people can come in either with a sense of meaning or trying to find meaning in their life, right? And again, because our work is so, lack of a better word, internal, it's very important that we support that. So we put a very, very big emphasis on training when people come in. In fact, all of the program content that we train, you know, school teachers and thousands of students on, all our staff are trained on the same and repeatedly. So they go through multiple trainings, they do exercises, we do, um, you know, um, uh, mindfulness and meditation type of things. We do journaling. There's there's a whole slew of different ways that people are, you know, that those skills are reinforced and you can learn to grow with it. Now, a very important piece of that is that that's not training just for you as an individual, right? A lot of the work that we're a lot of, uh, let me take a step back. Many of the children, if you look at the, the, the um, research on resilience, for example, one of one of the very very important pieces is that you have at least one good support person in your life as a child. For many of our kids, that doesn't necessarily exist. So our programs are all conducted in a facilitated peer support um, approach. It's a one hour a week program. We train the teacher. Let's say it's a school program. We train the school teacher as a facilitator, not a leader, but as a facilitator. And the interactions of that peer support will become very, very important. And one very simple sort of, uh, but maybe profound example of that is a 12 or 13 year old girl may come in to the group and say, my parents are trying to pull me out of school and get me married at this age. What, I don't know what to do. And so the support of the other girls or kids in the group become very, very important. It's not as simple as going to a school teacher or administrator saying, this is what happens and come in and save me. They often come up with solutions themselves using their, their character strengths and the skills that, they, that they've, they've learned. So I'm bringing that up because we try to mirror that in our staff training as well, so that you're doing this you know, in a, in a, in a facilitated peer support uh, fashion. So I think that that training is really important. And of course, the values that we have come up with within the organization, of course, are, 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 are critical. Um, so it's a mix of ensuring that your role, as it's defined, you know, just like in any organization, that your job itself is, is um, giving you rooms for growth and a way for you to reach your own potential, as well as feeling a connection, um, you know, to the beneficiaries and feeling that kind of uh, sense of support and connection within the organization. Have you seen any dark sides of being engaged in such deeply meaningful work? You know, I um, I know that they exist. <laughs> uh, yes, I've seen it. Um, I would not say I I'm, have experienced it myself uh, because I work very closely with my wife and partner. Uh, we run this organization together. We're together, you know, sort of 24-7. Um, and we enjoy that deeply. And our skills very much are complementary to each other. So we each have our own kind of lane. And, you know, the, the levels of, of, I mean, the instances of conflict or disagreement are, are I could probably count in one hand over, over 15 years. However, I think there's a, there's, there's a couple of things. I mean, I personally... Before I entered into this work, uh, I moved into the NGO world about 20, uh, well, it's 2001, I think, so 22 years. Before that, I worked in the private sector for several years in Silicon Valley. And for me personally, I hated every single day of it. Now, why did I hate it? Because the work had no meaning to me. doesn't mean it doesn't have meaning to others, but it, it didn't have meaning to me. When it really came down to it, I watched myself. I watched my, and I was, you know, and, and I was a leader. I was a manager. I, I had some authority and responsibility and things like that. But I watched myself behaving in ways uh, and making choices that were really incongruent with who I felt I was. And so I've been 
very careful, I guess, or very conscious as much as I can since moving into this work and particularly with world being um, to help others not, <laughs> you know, not have, have that experience. Have I seen the dark sides of this? Yes, because one thing that I have seen in this sector for people who work in it for many, many years is um, it's not just about the potential for burnout. There's something deeper than that. Like we work in a field where the challenges are really real and tangible and can really be in your face, right? Poverty, violence, discrimination, and so on. And it's pervasive. And so for many of the people that we work with, I mean, it, you know, our employees and so on, or other people that I mean in the sector, this is an everyday reality. That's their own lived experience. But what I notice is there's a difference between there's a difference between people who are able to approach this work from a place of love versus anger. And it's not that the anger isn't justified. It's that the anger is a that's a resource that burns out. That's an emotion that that has a that, that burns out over time, burns you out over time. It's exhaustible. And those who approach it from this place of love and connection and empathy and, and so on, I find just have a more inexhaustible energy. And hmm. that is where, you know, meaning and how you approach your work, your meaningful work. That's where your approach to meaningful work really has to be conscious from my perspective, because it can really, it can take you over. Mm. Um, and one of the things that I've often said, you know, to our team is work will never ask you to do less ever. It doesn't matter what kind of work you do. No, no work <laughs> ever asks you to do less. It always asks you to do more. But in this field in particular, <clears throat> excuse me, in this field in particular, you become very conscious if you've done it for long enough to know that you will actually never succeed. The work will never be done. It will never be enough. And if you don't accept that and approach your, your your every day with that in mind, then then the levels of frustration and, and the sense of all the things that you don't have control over, you know, are are pervasive. It's overwhelming. And if you focus on your attitude, your choices, understanding that your responsibility is to contribute to the work and to do the work, but not to complete it, then you have a bit of a different outcome, I think. One thing that I, I want to be able to to pull out is something that you actually said fairly early on there about uh, about your personal experiences of not necessarily feeling that dark side um, and uh, and and how important it was to be able to be doing this work with your with your wife with your partner. Um, that's actually a, a piece of research that Carrie Olberger has um, has done. So Carrie's uh, Carrie's done a lot of work studying specifically those who work in international aid and do other kinds of deeply meaningful work, and um, and and what some of the the very positive and some of the dark sides are of doing that work. And um, and of course, within within the literature, there are a lot of really good positive benefits of being associated um, with meaningful work. There there are Things like you know organizational commitment goes up, um, your your kind of citizenship behaviors increase. You're you're ultimately more pro social on the job. There's generally a lot more creativity and innovation in the work that you do because you think it's important. And you think that's worth you know putting time and effort into. Um, so generally, there's more motivation. There's more commitment um, because you're doing all of those things, whether it's performance or impact. You know, tends to be higher than um, than for people who don't feel that their their work is meaningful. And we also know that on the dark side, when people are engaged in such deeply meaningful work, and especially when there's that really high moral stake, as, as you're describing in the work that you do, where it really feels like this matters in a really big way, um, the more moral stake there is, the more people are just willing to give it their all. They, they, they go into what Bob Valorin would describe as obsessive passion mode, um, where they just they can't give up. To a certain extent, and and all of that effort 
um, can can in some ways open them up to conditions where they'll just they'll work harder, they'll work more, they'll work for less, they'll put themselves into challenging situations, um, often in contexts and in industries where there just isn't that much to be able to pay people. There are finite resources, so people are asked to work more, they're asked to do to do more for less. Um, they aren't necessarily given the resources to be able to compensate. All of that tends to lead to career regret, to excess of stress. Um, to burnout, as you described, um, certainly things like compassion fatigue, um, empathy, like empathy overload, many other things like that. But one of the the big mediating factors that Carrie Olberger uh, has has discovered is that there's this there's this big piece around that that's called boundary inhibition. And what she describes boundary inhibition as is is that um, is that basically when meaningful work kind of takes over our lives, it in some ways annihilate annihilates the boundaries between work and life, and and the kinds of resources that we actually need to sustain ourselves um, are. A, are, are a consequence of that boundary inhibition. Like we, we can't access them. Um, we kind of burn out the relationships that we have in our lives. Um, and and the key thing that she has discovered is that especially in close interpersonal relationships, so between spouses, between partners, um, between, between loved ones, um, if there's a huge values alignment between the person who's doing that international aid and their spouse and partner, um, that boundary inhibition in some ways isn't an issue and, and and in some ways it it makes it makes the work even more meaningful and enjoyable because both partners see the tremendous value of being able to to do that extra to go that extra mile um when your partner doesn't necessarily agree um with what you're doing or doesn't have those same shared values that's where so much of the problem can 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 come in and um, and it really erodes relationships um, let me just pause there and see if you have any comments on any of that. Oh, my answer to that is that was beautifully stated. And yes, all of the above. <laughs> all of the above. I think that's um, all of that is true. And I would say in my own personal life, I have certainly found that to be true. It is an hmm. absolute joy and blessing to be able to work with my wife side by side not because it bleeds over into our personal life, because we're very, very careful about that. And the good news is we have little kids that force us <laughs> to to be attentive, and that's a good thing. You know, that we we adore our kids, and um, and they demand that kind of attention from you anyway. So it's very nice to close the door on work, and uh, and then both go and and um, you know work with, not work with, enjoy the other. Uh, aspects, you know, other aspects of our life. It's also a huge benefit because I uh, travel um, quite extensively. Um, and I personally work very hard to to balance that of how, you know, how frequently I'll go, for how many days I'll go, because I um, am very cognizant of the effect that that has on my, my, my own children. Um, mm. So for me, most of this is really uh, you know, worked out very well. I will say it it's has been interesting over the years. <laughs> part of this is kind of funny, but but in a sad way, <laughs> um, to see how some of my relations, personal relationships, you know, friends have changed. I don't have very many friends who do the work that I do. In fact, most of them do not. And I would say also, certainly when I was younger, most of them were frankly, less less concerned, if you will, around the issue of meaning in their work than than I was. Uh, you know, they had other values or prior other priorities that they that they focused on. I would say some of that has changed as we've aged. You know, I'm, I'm turning 60, most of my friends are about the same age. And um, and so now meaning is, you know, popped up maybe a bit more for some of them than than it did previously. I don't mean that in a critical way. This is just simply kind of the way it was. So initially, when I made the choice to move in, into this work, um, you know, as I mentioned, to what 2000, 2001, um, I found, yeah, I had a little bit less maybe that I could share, except with certain friends, because I really had no idea what I was talking about, um, <laughs> rightfully so, right? And and the work was intense, you know, especially when I first started. 
uh, and I was pretty much on my own. I mean, now we're about maybe 80 people or so. When I started, I was I was one. Um, so that has fortunately moved in a very you know healthy way over the years. But definitely in the, in the beginning, um, that was a little challenging. And then I also would the humorous part I was I was alluding to was was I recognized because of course I was a small nonprofit and starving every day that uh, whenever I went to a party, nobody wanted to talk to me because they were <laughs> sure that I was going to hit them up for money. So, so you know, that that's that's the other thing. Oh, here he comes. He's going to ask for money, which, of course, I did not do or would never do. But um, I could see that in certain, in the eyes of certain people. Uh, the, the dangers, <laughs> the dangers of doing good work. Right. Um, and the other thing I want to dive into a little bit more is, uh, is I think that what you've just articulated or what you articulated before it's a really beautiful notion that that you've seen one of the protective factors it's focusing on love rather than focusing on anger uh and uh and and i'm i'm hoping that you can just kind of pull that back a little bit and talk about kind of what what that actually looks like mm. um, in practice and sure let me start that's a wonderful question i appreciate you, you asking it let me start with so internally within the organization what that means or what that was like to kind of set that up um, as a core value, if you will, you know, when I, so as I mentioned, when I started, I was, I was pretty much solo. I had a sort of a vision of what I wanted to create. And it was, I mean, really it was two visions, you know, it's what I wanted to do in the world and how, how I wanted to do it. So really the place that I wanted to be in within myself, in my own sort of development, spirit of development and so on, um, as well as what kind of values I was hoping to inculcate within an organization. Now, when I started and set up our first team in, in uh, India, um, and the main location for that, and that actually really still continues to be is, is a state called Bihar, India. It's up in the Northeast. It's on the border of Nepal. It's a massive state. It's 120 million people. Quite poor. It's one of the poorest states in the country. Um, when I started and started bringing in our teams and so on, I had to walk this fine line, I guess, between pushing for the values that I wanted to see permeate this very young organization, as well as eliciting from the staff what they wanted. But none of them had any experience, you know, working in an organization that asked any of these kinds of questions it was quite new. So, you know, I really pushed on what kind of place do you really want to spend your time in? What kind of place do you want this to be? And we really pushed on, you know, authenticity, values around around deep listening, around forgiveness and empathy, and and while also insisting on accountability. Because sometimes that gets to be a little bit of a slippery slope. So that was an interesting area. And it's, it's it, you know, to really kind of to, to push on. So I think initially, you know, I had to like kind of guide and train people around that. And then it became more of a collective ownership. And, and I have to say that has been really rewarding for me um, to see. And that has really greatly changed over, over, over time. For 10 plus years, I went to India four times a year, every three months I was there. And every single time I was doing some kind of training. Now I go twice a year and I almost never do training. I'm in and out quite quickly. I'm mostly there for government meetings and strategies and things like that. And the team itself has, has taken all of that on and in cold case that within new employees and, and new staff and so on. So that, that, that's that been a transition that's really you know very exciting. Um, exciting to see. And in India, excuse me, in Kenya, where we've been about six years, I think now, five or six years. And Ramonda, we've been there about three years. Similarly, in the early days, I would have been doing all that training. And I'm not even talking about training school teacher. I'm just talking about training staff. Now our team of trainers goes over there and does that. So I've probably done a grand total of two or three days training maximum in each each of those countries where the rest of it's being done by our team. And it's really incredibly gratifying to see that continue to permeate. 
And one other thing I'll say around that is like in one other sort of permutation of that was during COVID. Because everybody was on lockdown, particularly in India. And it was extremely stressful. And particularly during one period where people were dying left and right, the government's reporting around the numbers of people who actually died is extremely underreported. And we had staff facing all sorts of huge challenges. I couldn't fly over there, so on and so forth, right? So, um, and they couldn't get to go. So we started online support groups. And they were weekly, and we just randomly assigned everybody, you know, five to seven people into a group. They you know, meet once a week for an hour. And of course, you didn't have to do it if you didn't want to. But it was a perfect example of an organization, in my mind, putting people's health and well-being first, um, and them taking ownership over it, as opposed, you know, from a top-down kind of kind of a model. There, uh, there are once again so many things about the ways that you've just described some of those things that are truly, you know, deviant in a very positive way about what um, about what world being and specifically what you have a leader as a leader have done in that organization over um, over the last fifteen years that very much resonate with what the evidence base is around um, around what to do in organizations to be able to to make sure that you're tackling meaningful work in the most ethical. Um, and dignified kinds of ways. Um, certainly a key piece of that starts with values. Um, and, and the idea of being able to, to co-create or, or do participatory, um, ways of, of building values together with staff, um, and, and the right kinds of values, values that are ultimately very much about, about, about sustainable humanity and love, um, you know, to use your word, um, is, uh, is is a really critical component of of what some of that research says makes a really big difference. I'm I'm curious in in the ways in which um when when you were kind of creating um that cultural foundation of um of world being what were the ways in which cultural difference showed up in those values? Yeah, that's a great question. Um and they continue to show up, you know, and of course, uh, in a conversation of lumping India and Kenya and Rwanda all together. And of course, they're yeah, all with the U.S. Extreme, right, with... And the U.S., I mean, we're all extre extremely different and um, and trying to be mindful of all that all the time, you know, is 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 very difficult. Um, one of the things that we like to say, and 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 honestly, you, you probably know the research better than I do, but we I had this I mean, the core of our work, if you will, is based on universal values, what I hope are universal values. And maybe this is all just a big experiment. Are they really universal values? Yeah. You know? And I and I and I and I I bring those down to the big three or four: love, compassion, forgiveness, gratitude. And of course, there are more, and we can get it all into you know positive relationships and positive meaningful work and so on and so forth. But to the extent that we can focus on fostering that in the next generation, regardless of culture, and again, mirror that in our own org organization, regardless of our individual differences, I guess my hope is that that kind of one of these, it doesn't supplant it, but it kind of trumps the other. I don't really want to use the word Trump, but it's kind of, you know, it's kind of, it, 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 it's something that can permeate everything universally. So there's a couple of, um, you know, there's a couple of key maybe phrases or sort of, I don't know if these are values or phrases or, or, or guiding principles in our organization. One is um, every moment is, is, is a choice between love and fear. And we all fall down on that every single minute of the day, mm. consistently, all of us. Now, most of us go to work thinking, I've got to be primed, I've got to be primed for success, I've got to be perfect, you know, I've got to be in my best game, and so on and so forth. And for me, that's all a lie. That just this doesn't happen. So the second 
piece that we, our second motto, if you will, is perfection is not an option. Now, if you're willing to engage in or to take that on, perfection is not an option. Every moment is a choice between love and fear. As I look at my colleagues, as I look at my own performance, and as I look at the performance of my colleagues, that naturally then elicits empathy and forgiveness. You're either going to judge them for that, which means you're ascribing to the principle that perfection actually is possible, or you're going to say, we really need to keep ourselves and each other accountable because at the end of the day, we are a very performance-driven organization and we're all about impact. But how we do that, who we are as we do that is just as important as what we actually do. And so that is what we strive for. And you have to strive for it knowing a hundred times a day, you're going to make the fearful choice. Of course I do. Every day around strategy, about my, my response to something that didn't work out the way I wanted it to, a grant that I thought was going to come in that didn't, a, a program that's delayed. You know, you can pick the, the problem, you know, the myriad of problems every single day. But there is something about keeping the focus on it's okay. What I'm really practicing here is an attitude of love and kindness to myself and to others and to our beneficiaries. And to me, that that's more important than all the other stuff. There are so many aspects of what you've done to set up this organization that um, that are truly extraordinary. Some of the things that I've heard you talk about already uh, on on this call, um, in terms of the ways that you've considered, you know, the culture, the policies, the leadership style itself of the organization. You know, you've talked about how you even think about defining the job itself to make sure that um, that it, it's it's serving the growth um, potential of the individuals who are working there how you hire the right people and make sure that they're actually connected to the mission of what you're trying to do, how you train everybody really from the inside out uh, to to not only kind of walk your own talk, but also to feel it in, in a truly authentic way. Um, the ways in which you infuse your values um, into both your how and your what. The the yes, you are a performance and impact driven organization, but you do that in a way where um, where where you're actually bringing in these these wonderful these wonderful values of of love and um, and <clears throat> and compassion and empathy and making that visible by you know these these not just phrases but ways in which you're living a life of every moment is a choice of love versus fear perfection is not an option um all of that just sounds like it it really creates a a world of empathy and psychological safety within the whole organization i mean, I, I i i'm it's very inspiring to be able to hear you talk about some of those things that's very kind of you and andrew uh, andrew and of course Perfection is not an option. So all those things that you just said, we fell at. <laughs> right. But it's what we strive for. Yeah. Uh, it's what I believe. Uh, I mean, I really believe in. And one of you, you just reminded me, you know, in, in very early on as we were setting up this organization this many years ago, when we were setting up a lot of this initial work, I said, think about the things that you most hated about your last job. And inevitably they came down to and I think this is pretty universal. They come down to blame and gossip. Hmm. There's nothing more. Of course, there are there, there are other things like you know, do I have a, do I have the opportunity to grow, and am I given the right responsibilities and accountability, and so on, and you know all the things that we know from the literature. But when you really think about it, on a, an emotional sort of interpersonal level, which people are always striving for, you know, to have that in it be healthy in their work context. Blame where I'm being blamed or someone else is being blamed, which then leads to gossip. And I don't think there's anything more powerful than gossip than to destroy an organization. And the opposite of that is what? Psychological safety, as, as, as you said, you know, and, and a team and a management structure and so many other things that 
are looking for accountability and are looking for impact and performance, and at the same time, allow you to be a human being and to to discover your own path, you know, and to embark on your own your own journey towards love. That's the way I see that. So let's say that you're not quite so fortunate to be working at a world being um, <laughs> or an organization that you know espouses psychological safety and actually tries to do things that create it. Um, you don't have control over the way that things are structured or the way that you've been hired or the way that that work is measured or evaluated. Um, and you still want to try to protect yourself in uh, and bolster and buffer uh, your own well-being. Do you have any recommendations as to what those engaged in deeply meaningful work can do at the individual level? I guess the answer to that is run. I, I, and and I know not everybody can do that, of course. Uh, I don't mean that lightly. But there, I think we often do, I, I, and certainly many people do not have the option, but we often do forget that there is another option. I I will say personally, I took a huge risk in 2000. I was the number two guy at a startup. Three weeks into that job, I had a major rollover car accident and was nearly killed. And I walked away from that and saying, and my daughter, my first daughter, um, was just only a few months away from being born. And I walked away from that accident saying, I've had it, I'm done. And regardless of what the stakes are, I quit. And I was a stay-at-home dad pretty much for about two years while I figured it out. And yeah, I lost a ton of money. I lost my marriage. I lost pretty much everything. But I walked through that fire and I merged with the, I merged with my relationship with my child intact. And, and I found my way, you know, my own path. That's an extreme example, I think, but there is the option to look at something else when, if the system itself is that you have in this case, elected to be in okay this isn't a system like some of the systems that we work in i'm talking about just your job there is the option to find other ways of you know other places to be employed i think the second piece is yeah psychological safety in these type of environments is is it's kind of an age-old question I, I, you know it brings me to in in super extreme and i mean it's super extreme and i'm not even talking about the workplace here you know, can you be nonviolent in a violent situation? We're going through that now, of course, in many different uh, large challenges in the world. And it's an age-old, age-old question, and we're not going to solve it here on this on this <laughs> on this podcast. But I personally would like to say I err on the side of yes, you can be nonviolent in a violent situation and still walk out with your dignity intact, and hopefully more. Thank you, Steve. Um, if uh, if there's a place that uh, that people can go to learn more about uh, about world being, where where should they go? Sure, www.worldbeing.org. We are a nonprofit, so I wouldn't be able to I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't finish this <laughs> with a plug. Do consider donating to our cause, <laughs> but more importantly, get involved with whatever's important to you. Thank you for joining us for another episode of Meaningful Work Matters. If you haven't already done so, be sure to subscribe to our podcast on your favorite platform. And if this episode resonated with you, please take a moment to leave us a review. Your feedback helps us make this podcast better and reach more listeners. You can connect with me, Andrew Soren, on LinkedIn or visit www.eubd.ca to learn more about eudaimonic by design. Finally, if what you heard today spoke to you, tell your colleagues and people in your community about our podcast. We really appreciate your support in making meaningful work matter. See you next time.